All right. It sounds like people are still logging into the meeting, so we'll just give it um, a minute or two for people to keep logging in, but I want to welcome you all to our October Utah Children's Care Coordination Network meeting. Um, we have a full agenda today, so we're going to jump right in. And so I'll spend a little bit of time on announcements and updates, and then um, we're going to spend the majority of the meeting talking about supporting transgender youth, and we have um, a family perspective here today, um, a family with lived experience. We're really excited to hear from them. And then also a few representatives from our, um, the University of Utah Health um, Transgender, or Transgender Health Program that are gonna more on like some of the laws impacting clinical care and guidance around transgender youth, and um, also some of the clinical guidance. So we're excited to hear from them as well. So for some of our announcements, as always, if you want to take a minute and um, rename your profile, just so we know um, maybe what clinic you're coming from, the role you have in your clinic, that's helpful for us just as we're trying to network. And, um, you know, we're happy to take questions to the chat as the present presentation is happening as well. Um, I'll try to field and facilitate those as much as possible. Um, one announcement from the that the Utah Department of Health and Human Services wanted me to share is that they um, every five years they do this kind of broad spread or widespread community assessment and as much participation as they can get in that is helpful for um, planning their efforts uh, for the next five years. And this is with Title V funding that supports the health and well-being of mothers, children, adolescents, and children and youth. So I sent out um, some links to it on the, on the listserv this week. I will resend uh, attached to these meeting notes as well, but they have um, different ways that people can communicate. If you're a community member, if you work specifically with, or if you're specifically for children and youth with special health care needs and then for professionals as well. So if you, first of all, one, we encourage you to participate in that survey. And then also if you can share it through your channels and networks as well, that would be really great. Eric, did you have anything else you wanted to say about that? No, um, you've done a great job with that. We just uh, want to get as much feedback as possible and just take that feedback very seriously in our planning for maternal child health block grant and the activities that we will uh, use that funding for over the next five years. So please uh, distribute this within your networks. Um, if you're like me, you probably get these uh, types of uh, requests from several different channels, but we'd rather folks get hit two or three times than not receive uh, an opportunity to participate in th these surveys. So please feel free to distribute. Um, my second announcement is that we have been successful in getting the content from the Medical Home Portal website archived. And um, again, don't feel, feel like you need to write down this website. I'll send it out with the notes, but I just wanted to show you quickly what that looks like. It's through the um, uh, Libraries of Science at the university. And here's kind of like a general breakdown of the section. So um, uh, it's, it mirrors the, how the old website looked. So you had the for family section, um, a few for, for physician section, but you can also search by keyword up here. So for example, if you were looking at autism, it would pull up all of the pages that were specific with content and show you what section they were found in. So hopefully that's an easy way to navigate some of that archived content. It's all in PDF format. Um, that's just the way we were able to kind of capture the pages as they used to exist. So um, announcement about that. And then finally, just encourage everybody to um, continue to promote the SPARC study that's um, always ongoing and um, anybody can enroll in at any time um, for those with new diagnoses of autism. All right, so now jumping into our learning session, and I know we're doing our meeting a little bit. Um, we normally have our brainstorming and resource sharing during this time, but um, we, we're just excited to have a little bit more 
full learning session today and um, wanted to use this time for that instead. If we have time at the end of the meeting, we can jump in with um, people's other people's brainstorming um, or resource sharing, or you're welcome to put those in the chat as well, and I'll make sure they get out in the meeting notes. But um, for today's learning session, where it's all about supporting transgender youth, and we're first going to hear from Tanya and Leo Pickren, and um, they're going to share a little bit about their story and some things that they've found most helpful in um, finding and using resources in the community, and then also some advice for us is those who work in clinical settings about how we can better support transgender youth. So we will turn the time over to them. Okay, um, so uh, I'm Tanya and this is my son, Leo uh, Picron. And you wanna go ahead and tell your story and then I can fill in um, gaps. Okay. So introduce yourself. So I'm 16 now. And when I was 11 or 12, I was like very depressed and was going through a hard time. I was in fifth slash sixth grade and I was back in and out of the pediatrician's office because I, my depression manifested in more physical symptoms. And um, we finally got a recommendation to the gender, gender clinic, clinic, the U. The U. And um, we, the wait time was pretty intense. I would say it was four or five months. It's yes. Back then we thought that was intense. Yeah. And it's now worse it's now. definitely a lot longer. And um, then the COVID pandemic happened immediately or not immediately after, but during my wait time for the appointment, the pandemic began. And so my first appointment was initially on Zoom and we met with the gender affirming doctor and we went over just like symptoms of gender dysphoria and all that and then future steps. And since I was so young, I qualified for hormone blockers. And so the process then was probably a bit more complicated just because it was very early on in the COVID pandemic. But I initially, what? Nothing. You're okay. Um, and so I think, what was it? Maybe like a month later, which was pretty quick and also kind of rare considering it was May of 2020. We were the only people in the hospital and I went in for a hormone blocker rod in my arm. L what's the name of it? Was it Lupron? No, Lupron's the shot. No, <laughs> Haley will be able to answer <laughs> that question. Um, but yeah, he got the rod. In my arm. And I had that for a year or so. And then I was having like a physical symptoms that had moved a bit in my arm and it wasn't as comfortable. So I ended up getting that out and switching to hormone blocker shots in my leg. And I was on those for what, another year or so. Mm -hmm. And then when I turned 14, I was able to start testosterone, though I was actually like considered eligible a few months before I turned 14, but we did wait until the month after my 14th birthday. And I started with injections. Um, th the process to start testosterone was, I wouldn't say simple, but there were consent forms and everything I needed, both parents' consent, but it ultimately ended up being fine for me. Therapy. Oh yeah, therapy. I need a letter of recommendation. And so I was on, I've been on testosterone since my 14th birthday. So it'll be three years in January. Um, what else? You backed off on the dose of testosterone? Yeah. I started with injections and then I like the, the scar tissue in my stomach from doing injections, like was like so abundant that I switched to gel because when I was doing my shots, it wouldn't absorb as well because of the, the scar tissue. Um, and so I've been doing gel. I lowered my testosterone dose a bit. Um, what was that, like a year ago or so? Yes. But new recommendations show that they don't need quite as much testosterone, or their levels don't need to be as high. And he achieved the... Um, 
the goals you had for testosterone. Yeah. Once a lot of the effects are more permanent. So once I achieved them, I wasn't as eager to be getting such a high level of testosterone anymore. Um, what else happened? Oh, you're on a north, uh, you're on a um, birth control now uh, Alongside the testosterone. to, to stop any kind of periods. Um, and in 2020, in between his appointment with uh, the doctor online and us trying to get through the hoops of getting the medication shipped into Utah because it wasn't available here during a pandemic, um, I remember calling, he started his first period, uh, which was pretty traumatic for him. And I remember calling the nurse or getting patched through to the nurse. And I didn't had, this was my first interaction at the gender clinic at Utah, which I have amazing, I, we couldn't have done this without them. And I remember saying to the nurse, if I say my son just started his period, will you understand that? And she said, yep. And um, it was, she was amazing. And she talked me through it and she, she was just very empathetic to what we were going through. And then the push to get him on those puberty blockers became more important because uh, we were in the middle of a pandemic. He was going through something that was really traumatic to him. And uh, so, yeah, we were, we were able to get that medication. I will say we're fortunate. Um, my husband and I both work at the U. We have amazing insurance. Um, There are a lot of things that not everyone in this community that you'll see, the benefits that we have. We, we've, we understand that we have a lot of things in our corner when it comes to Leo's transition. If I was going through this now or like say a year ago, it wouldn't have been possible because of recent legislation. Um, I was thankful to get on hormone blockers and testosterone long before the bill passed, like saying no new patients could receive gender affirming care. So that was really helpful. And then I'm a, I'm a swimmer. And so that was a bit complicated, like just trans wise. And so we ended up going to Connecticut to get top surgery, um, what, like a year ago, A year ago. um, because it's illegal in the state of Utah if you're under 18. And that was a very positive yet rare thing for people, let alone under the age of 18 or even 15, to get. But it was definitely like a necessity for me to be able to continue swimming. And that was something that we as a family really, again, we had thought, well, we'll just wait until he's 18. Initially, I mean, when this all started, we'll wait until he's 18. And um, he was a freshman. He was swimming in, in, in his gender affirming. Um, yeah, as the as the gender he is, which is male. Um, and you could see on the swim deck how uncomfortable he was with the amount of breast tissue that he had, which wasn't hugely significant. But because he's so thin, it looked out of place. And he did experience some bullying um, from other people, not necessarily strictly on his team, but um, from other teams that were around. And it became clear to us that if he and he really wanted to continue swimming, that this was important to him. And so we made the decision to allow him And we found someone in, we had initially found someone here and then that law passed um, after our first uh, consultation. So we went and uh, he had what's called keyhole, which is a more minor version of top surgery where they could just make small incisions around the nipple and extract that tissue. And uh, so he swam again last year Uh, his times improved. The way he carries himself on the swim deck uh, is amazingly different. Um, I've had very supportive parents from his team say, oh, I love how confident he is this year. And uh, it, it made a huge difference. Didn't you agree? Yeah. Yeah. So...
yeah. I mean, if you want, I can give you the perspective of pre-diagnosis and where he is today. In fifth grade, he was having panic attacks. He couldn't eat, um, stomach aches all the time, uh, so depressed. And he was also losing, uh, he had also been diagnosed in fourth grade with a hearing loss. So it was very complicated for us to figure out if he was depressed over this, this hearing loss or, you know, puberty, fifth grade, his body started to change and he started showing signs of dysphoria. Um, he was on a swim team swimming as a female and he quit because he could not put on that swimsuit and go and swim. Um, I, we had a lot of conversations with his pediatrician and I was there to pick up records one day and I ran into her and she said, if you ever think this is something you need, the gender dysphoria clinic, there is a place that, you know, he can go. And we, she had known him for years and I felt like she kind of knew. And then we were at a therapist appointment in that January. And when I came back in, he the therapist said, you know, what do you want to tell your mom? And he said, I'm a boy. And it's like, okay. And so then we, we, you know, sat down as a family and we talked to his dad and his brother, um, eventually told his grandparents, I, I would say your family's pretty supportive. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, and now as an 11th grader, uh, he has, been to the Capitol for many, many legislative sessions trying to speak as a transgender person um, in Utah. He's written op-eds. He's excelling in school. Um, he's confident. He's looking ahead to college outside of the state of Utah. And uh, I think he's who he was always supposed to be. But again, we're really fortunate to have the gender clinic. We live maybe 10 minutes from it. And I know that your, your network is reaching people who maybe don't have it right in their backyard. Yes, thank you so much for um, sharing your story. As Do you have any other, um, I understand that the transgender health program has been hugely helpful to you. Have you found any other resources in the community that are also really helpful? Um, well, I go to InCircle almost weekly. It's like a LGBTQ um, like home almost for teens and young adults. It's just down almost like downtown Salt Lake City. They also have locations in like Ogden and Provo and I think St. George and Heber. Heber. Yeah, they have quite a few locations. Um, that's been helpful. Um, I'm on their like teen board kind of thing there. It's it's a great place for a lot of trans kids in Salt Lake. Um, no, I go there a lot. And what else do I? Um, what we immediately after he transitioned, I started looking for um, camps, summer camps for him to go to. And we found there's a couple, there's one in uh, California, there's one in Colorado. Um, we chose one that is in, located in New Hampshire. It's a very protected, like you don't, nobody gets the mailing address. You, you have to be vetted to go there. It's, um, it's like people around there have no idea. I mean, it's just a regular summer camp. I wanted him to have those kind of experiences that might not be available because um, he was trans. And so he went, the first year he went was 2021 after uh, the- I was supposed to go in 2020, but it got canceled. <laughs> right. So uh, he's been going there for four years. And in fact, the first year he went, um, he met one of his closest friends who lives in a neighborhood just <laughs> close to us in New Hampshire. They had seen each other at Encircle, and then they show, both show up at this camp um, from Salt Lake in the middle of New Hampshire. Um, and that was, he has a network of people from that. And they do a really good job of meeting people's needs for um, making it more available to uh, lots of people. And so that's 
a really great resource. And then there's a parent network from that. Um, Encircle also has a parent luncheon. And I went to that in 2020, right after he, before, so between January and um, March 20, what was it, 12th or 13th, I went to that parent luncheon a couple of times. And I, it was the first place I said to people, um, you know, my son is trans and uh, he, we were trying out his name, which completely stuck. We also did have his name changed on his birth certificate. He'll have to wait until he's 18 to have his gender changed. Um, and he's also, he was born in Texas. So that will be another challenge um, because of their laws. Uh, My birth certificate barely says Leo because yes. of it being in Texas. It yes. says it like in small print at the very, very bottom. Long. And it also took like months for them to finally like accept it and send it to us. So uh, his, I, I, um, I'm, I looked up and uh, applied for him to get a passport because the State Department allows you, you know, this is one thing, um, allows you to put your gender identity on your passport. And so then we used his passport instead of a birth certificate to apply for his driver's license um, so that his documentation matches how who he is and how he presents to the world and what the world sees. Um, and we recently, because obviously there's an election and the State Department may change those rules, now that he's 16, we went back, even though he had a valid passport, and got him a 10-year passport to ensure that that passport will say male for at least the next 10 years. Um, and I know it sounds like I'm crazy that I think about all of this stuff, but it's the small ways that we can protect our children out in the world. And so that all of his documentation will be Leo. Um, what else? Uh, other groups. There is a huge presence that started here in Utah. It's called Mama Dragons. It's one of those Facebook groups that has come out into the world. Um, it, it's, it's when I first started, it was a good place when I first started with Leo on this journey, it was a good place for me to find people to answer my questions without judgment. Um, it, it was, it was good. Those first couple of years, I got a lot of information, a lot of support. They <clears throat> run clinic things or not clinics. They run like, um, like modules for parents on how to navigate these things, like how to get name changes and how, and it's, it's a worldwide organization um, but as we've continued, it's kind of become not necessary, not necessary for me. Um, not that I know everything, but, uh, you also, when, when Leo is also in a very supportive school, um, uh, he's in a private school here and it's incredibly supportive and they have gender neutral bathrooms. So gender, like the bathrooms in the public school, don't affect because he's not in a public school he can go he's not affected by that law the bathroom bill um when he swims it's a little more dicey going into these spaces but as one of our friends um her her daughter was like i love leo but i don't want him in a girl's bathroom because like if he walked in it would be it, disconcerting so um it, that does present a challenge and we just roll with it. What else? I think that's kind of it. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, just maybe one last question I had, and then I'm going to open it up a little bit to the group for other questions, but if, is there any advice that you want to share? This is a group of people that work in clinics across the state. Um, and, and maybe just like things that were really helpful for you as you were coming into clinical settings that we can do as, um, staff to make the experience better. Um, I haven't really had many negative experiences with like doctors or clinicians, like really in Utah. I think I'm very fortunate for that. 
Um, but I think just being like open to everything and being knowledgeable. And I feel like that's kind of a very basic concept, but I think there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I know what the word transgender means, but they don't know much beyond that. And I think that's where it gets a bit dicey um, in settings where you do have a transgender patient, because you, if you're not transgender, you'll never really understand what it is like to be transgender, but you can understand what being transgender is without being transgender. You can be knowledgeable about like different gender identities without having it. And I think that goes a long way when having patients because it feels good to be understand it. Understood. Understood. <laughs> I'm really tired. <laughs> um, I uh, like it. It's a small thing, but the visible signs of um, the pins, the the what your your badge hangs on, and if there's pins there, just something that says. I, I stand with you is huge. Um, and, and when he has to go to a pediatrician that is not one of our own or that we don't know very well, when I'm making those appointments, I am very, uh, I, I'm a gatekeeper. So I ask, do parents need to ask those questions if their child is seeing someone just off the cuff for something, um, you know, like, and and I will say that the, we haven't really run into, there's a, a very new generation of pediatricians at the U um, and ev everyone seems to be uh, very much aligned with being supportive of LGBTQ kids and trans kids. Um, but there was an old guard and before, and I was very careful to make sure that we weren't falling into those spaces. Um so yeah, just, uh, I think your point was really great. I, I kind of disagree with you about wearing a like rainbow pen or something. Like it is nice to see someone representing that, but also I feel like some people will put on a rainbow pen and think that that makes them like understanding and knowledgeable about things, even though they're just wearing a pen or like a lanyard or something. I think there's a lot more to it than just visually showing that you're accepting. Fair point. Oh. Um, sorry about that no <laughs> you're okay um i'm gonna open it up for a few minutes for questions i know you have to get off to school leo so how much time more time do we have um i'm totally fine i don't really have a class until 9 45 okay. and i live like four minutes from school okay okay <laughs> sounds good well let's Let's open it up for questions. I'll just, if you want to raise your hand or put it in the chat or even just unmute yourself and ask, go ahead. We'll um, do questions for maybe five or 10 minutes. Yeah, Carrie, go ahead. First of all, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing like what an impactful amount of information you've shared with us. And just the two of you have brought me to tears. You're both beautiful. It's amazing. And um, that quickly, Leo, what have you found really helpful for you personally with your friends and do you have a unit of friends that are very supportive or that you found through this process like if we had a, a patient who was going to start transitioning what would you say to look for in friends and to share with friends yeah so at school some of my friends know I'm trans some of them don't I know they'd all be very supportive either way um, it just honestly doesn't come up that much in my conversations with them. I've been at the same school since I've transitioned, but again, it was years ago. <laughs> There's been new kids. Some of my friends weren't even like in the state of Utah when I transitioned. So that's kind of interesting. And then when I go to InCircle, the LGBTQ house thing, I've met a lot of people there who obviously know I'm trans because that's like my purpose for going there. And that's really wonderful. I think it's like meeting people who are trans like obviously I'm not gonna like every single person who's trans because that's just a very small person of my or small part of my identity but like sometimes it's a lot easier to connect to someone when you like already share something like so like important to like your life story um and I think when like trying to make friends while being trans it's a bit complicated because you almost kind of have to like vet your friends to make sure like if something happened and they found out 
like, would that be okay? Or would it cause like something to happen in our friendship? And I'm kind of the person who would rather like, if, if I thought something would go wrong in the friendship, I'm not going to pursue it because I don't want to get hurt in the long run. But like, I think there's so many ways to see if someone's accepting, like you can talk about trans issues without being trans. It's very relevant. Like politics recently have been very trans like related. And I think you can always bring that up and talk about not everyone wants to talk about it. But being trans is very relevant. And I assure you that people everyone knows a trans person regardless of if they are supportive or not. Or even though they know a trans person. Yeah. Um, but just like in today's society, there's a lot of trans people, I feel like. And so it's okay. Like, I don't know, because I know people at school who I'm not sure if they'd be supportive or not of me, but I can still be nice and friendly to them. It's not like we need to have a deep, like, connection about anything, but, like, we can we can be kind to each other without totally accepting of everyone's, like, life, I feel like. Please tell the story of Jane Jane, what about in the Jane? essay. Oh, I wrote a, um essay for a competition And um, apparently I have a very specific writing style and we had to anonymously share it to the class. And one of my friends found out I was trans because she knew I wrote it. And she was like, oh, this is yours. And then it was like, okay, cool. And we haven't talked about it since. And I think that's totally fine. Okay, any other questions? Hi. My name's Haley. I want to first thank both of you for sharing such a beautiful and impactful story with us. And I think it's really important for everybody on this call to take your, your points of information. Um, I do have a question. How did you navigate the school um, when you enrolled as a new gender? Was that, was there any issues with that? Or was how did how did that process go to make it smooth when you did go to class um well my school's very accepting i'm at private school so i think a lot of the like rules com like gender identity and like having a legal name versus like not a legal name is different in public schools in the state of utah and so we i came out during covid on zoom to my entire class they had like a little meeting and someone was just like hey Leo's trans and this is his name and these are his pronouns now and then that was the end of the meeting we were initially going to wait until like a new year started at school but then when we had to go to zoom class it was like well why not now I don't have to see any of these kids for a while so um but my school is very great like I mean they changed my name in all the documents online like there's nothing that would say like anything else besides Leo since the second I came out um All of my teachers were great about it. And then when I entered seventh grade the next year, a lot of the teachers didn't even know because they didn't know me in sixth grade because we were online the entire time. So I think just it was it was pretty easy. I know I have friends who are in public school and until they legally changed their name, all the school documents would not say their actual name. So that's a bit complicated. But for me personally, it was very simple. I just had to tell the administration and they just changed everything. Like my school email got changed to Leo immediately. It was it was pretty simple. It was oh, part of our decision to to do it earlier on Zoom was that when you're on Zoom, your name that you're assigned with your school computer was there and he hated seeing that. I mean, we were already calling him Leo at home. This was just another space for him to be himself. Thank you so much. Any other questions? All right, well, we're so grateful, Tanya and Leo, that you can join us this morning. Um, it's so great to have somebody with lived experience share their story as part of our learning about supporting transgender youth. And you have a great story to share, and we're so glad that you could join us today. And we're now going to turn the time over to 
um, Haley McLaughlin and Ariel Mann. We're from the University of Utah Transgender Health Program. <clears throat> Sorry, Haley is the nurse coordinator and Ariel is the outreach network and development specialist at those at that program. And to get a little bit more information about some of the legislation that um, Leo referred to and also some of the clinical guidance that's out there now. So I'll go ahead and turn the time over to them. Okay, it helps if I just like unmute myself, I guess. Um, I'm Haley and Ariel, are you gonna introduce yourself? I sure can, go, you go ahead, go ahead first. So I'm Haley McLaughlin, I'm the clinical nurse coordinator in the Adolescent Medicine Clinic and the GEMS Clinic at Primary Children's. Um, and thanks so much, Leo and Tanya for sharing your story. And, um, and I have been with the clinic for almost six years, five and a half, like almost six years. And, uh, and I came to the clinic having already had, uh, experiences similar to Tanya and Leo's, not the same, obviously, but my, uh, youngest son is transgender. And so we had navigated this before I started working in the clinic and we're still, are still in the process, of course, because even as an adult, you're navigating this space in a different way. Um, and now I'll let Ariel introduce herself. Hi y'all, I'm Ariel. I chose to have an off-camera day today. Um, but I work with Haley. I'm more on the administrative side of the transgender health program. So I work on our education and training, marketing and outreach, community engagement, um, trying to make sure that uh, healthcare providers have the information they need to best serve transgender people. Um, so that's what we're doing here today. And Haley's going to take the lead on this, but I'll be available for any kind of like referral-based questions or kind of just programmatic questions if there are any. Thanks, Ariel. And um, I'm just going to say, I'm like pretty tangential when I talk and I don't do well with slides because I didn't prepare very well. So we'll just see how we go. Um, and hopefully I'll just leave a lot of time for questions if there are any at the end. So hoping to talk today about language, how language affects um, patient outcomes, recognizing the mental health disparities with LGBTQ youth, especially transgender youth, um, identifying different ways that we can create positive spaces and gender affirming spaces in the world around everybody, and um, talking about Senate Bill 16 and how that impacts care in Utah and surrounding states and what care options are available. So nationally, um, transgender youth make up about 1.4% of the population or roughly 300,000 transgender youth are out there in the US. And then um, in Utah, it's sort of just under 1%. And these are people that identify as trans and I'm sure that that number is higher because a lot of people don't report this while they're still um, under 18. So roughly 2,100 people in Utah, we could guess are transgender identifying youth. So you're definitely seeing these people in your clinic or in your spaces, public spaces. So I'm sure this is review for lots of people by now, but there are some basics that tend to get conflated in um, in lots of healthcare settings and beyond there. So there's sex assigned at birth versus gender, like identity versus expression of your gender and, and sexual orientation, which is totally separate from gender. So gender identity is in the brain. It's how we identify, um, do we have feelings of being masculine or feminine or somewhere in between? And then uh, gender expression is how we're going to express that in the clothes we wear, in the way we present ourselves to the world. And then your sex assigned at birth is the anatomy that you're born with or were assigned at birth by whoever, whoever made that determination when you came out of the womb. And then so emotional attraction and physical attraction are both sexual orientation and have nothing to do really with your gender. And so um, somebody like a trans man who is attracted to men is 
a gay man and a trans man who's attracted to women is a would identify as like a heterosexual a heterosexual man. And I'm racing through some of these because I kind of want to focus on more of the actionable things we can do in public spaces to really impact in a positive way this community. So gender identity, the language around these things, a lot of people hear the term cis and don't know what that means. Cisgender is just somebody who whose gender identity aligns with their birth assigned gender. So I, if I identified as female and I was born with a uterus and ovaries and those things, then I would be cisgender. And a transgender person is somebody who there's an incongruence between the, the um, or identify as something different than their birth assigned sex. And then gender fluid is somewhere in between. So sometimes somebody who's gender fluid might feel more masculine or feminine and maybe doesn't align completely and consistently with one gender or another. And that includes sort of a gender where maybe they don't even associate or identify with any gender or feel non-gendered. And gender queer is just everyone else on that spectrum who just feels a little out of alignment with the sex assigned at birth. Mental health disparities. So if we're talking about gender dysphoria, this diagnosis is important, especially in Utah now and, um, and everywhere really. So we would say that somebody is gender dysphoric and somebody can be diagnosed as gender dysphoric by a primary care provider, by any healthcare professional could make this diagnosis. Um, and really it's, if you're seeing a patient who, um, who expresses any of these, or at least not any, but at least two of the following criteria, and primarily it's a marked incongruence between their sex assigned at birth and the gender that they align with or identify with. And a lot of times this means um, they desire to have parts that they weren't born with. They um, have a strong desire for uh, being perceived this other way in the world, the way that they identify. Um, most of our patients, I would say, and most people that we see have pretty much all of these uh, these characteristics or would um, endorse all of these feelings on this list. Um, but really you need two or more and there needs to be some consistency in that over a period of time. So we wouldn't even um, start any sort of transition without somebody having, we say six months here for the diagnosis, but before we would even take any sort of, before we would advance into any sort of uh, medical transition, we would need to see a consistent and insistent um, presentation of this for much longer, typically. So um, LGBTQ youth, especially transgender youth, have a much higher rate of depression and anxiety than uh, their cisgender counterparts. And we can just keep moving through this, I think. And then the risk of suicide is much higher and attempted suicide. I mean, considering suicide, 46% of uh, transgender youth considered suicide in the last year and 16% attempted it. That's a much higher um, rate than a general population would or cisgender, cisgender counterparts would be contemplating this. And we definitely see this reflected in our population in clinic. The minority stress model, I mean, this is obviously not the only minority that is affected by this. I would say that in the last few years with the political climate where it is, we've watched this um, a pronounced change in, in the way that the existential threats and existential hostility that our transgender youth experience directly impacts the mental health of, of everybody, even patients that have all the resources and all the access are still um, are still impacted by this because they move through the world that we're all moving through and um, and this just places them at a higher risk. So we're all seeing these things. certainly our kids are seeing them and and um, and there is more and more rhetoric around uh, anti-trans legislation and um, and I can say that every legislative session here in Utah, we watch this um, in real life with just 
the level of anxiety going up, tearful phone calls from parents and um, patients for months while this is happening. And again, the legislative impacts on mental health are pronounced and palpable. So 90% of young people saying that their mental health is impacted by recent politics, I would say, I would say that it's probably even higher. I don't know anybody whose mental health doesn't feel impacted by this that is that identifies as trans or gender diverse. So we're going to talk about best practices and how we can um, make the change in our spaces, um, especially primary care. I feel like because we're like primary care, if you're a librarian, you make a big difference. All these people make a big difference. Every touch point that somebody has in their life is impactful, in a can be impactful in a positive or negative way. Um, I think it's really important in healthcare, especially in primary care, to be asking questions about gender identity from an early age. And in our clinic, our providers do that by asking questions like, so do you feel more like a boy or a girl or somewhere in between? And they ask quest like these questions of young patients. And ideally that's something that we're asking people because it is such a part of, or an important part of a young person's developing identity to be able to even think about that because, um, because they're gonna be asking themselves those questions either way. And it's nice to be able to talk about that in a trusted and safe space. And if we're doing patient-centered care or providing patient-centered care, we need to understand our patients. So let's talk about more of the gender affirming spaces. And Tanya talked about this and so did Leo. Um, we can move on to the next slide, I think. Thanks. So, um, safe spaces impact on suicide attempts. So um, it's pretty obvious, I think, in studies and then just also what we can see happening that um, the suicide rates and uh, depression and suicide ideation is markedly less with people who have at least one affirming adult in their life. And the more people in their life that are accepting and gender affirming, the lower the risk. So. So we can all make a difference, whether it's with people who we love and are in our lives that way, or are just people that we're meeting one time ever. Some of the way we can do that is like with our physical environment. So um, Tanya mentioned a lanyard and like the stuff on your badge. And I wear this lanyard just because and I have a wristwatch that does it, but I also have pins on my lanyard and my badge has my pronouns on it. More and more people are putting their pronouns on their badges. And all those things are just ways to signal um, to signal to people that you are open to having conversations about gender. Um, and it isn't enough, as Leo said, to just put a pin on and say, okay, now I'm fluent in all things gender. But being educated and continuing to educate yourself is important. But even little things that you can do, like in your day to day, if you have a mug that just says like trans rights or human rights or any of those things become signals. I can't tell you how many patients come in and see a lanyard and then just the patient's eyes light up because often they're with somebody in their life that, I mean, we're lucky enough to have people that are like our clinic sort of self-selects for people that are coming in to get their kids care. But in primary care spaces, then it could be that families aren't there doing that and they're maybe not supportive. So having an adult or somebody in their in their uh, experience who shows them it's okay and it's safe to be who you are is a hugely impactful thing that any of us can do. So we can also do this on intake forms and the way that we are asking questions. So just your intake forms can be different and and we have patients that notice this. So I hear from patients all the time that um, that they're uncomfortable going to their doctor's office because they're so gendered on the forms. So just even like the stuff that people are filling out when they come into your office um, signals to people whether or not this is a safe space for them to be themselves. And so I'm sure you can have access to these slides later, but 
these are sort of recommended alternatives to things that we sort of maybe are still seeing on intake forms. And gender identity asking about this is a two-step process. So we wanna ask about their gender identity and then what sex they were assigned at birth. There should be a differentiation between this on all the things where you're asking about um, gender and sex. Of course, it's important to know what their sex assigned at birth is, especially in healthcare, because um, there are sex specific uh, issues that you'd wanna be looking for and addressing. And it's also equally important to know how somebody identifies when treating a patient. So, we can wrap that up by just saying using pronouns. That's a big one. It's probably the biggest one is um, ideally we're asking everybody um, what pronouns they use. Um, and so rather than making an assumption and it should be everybody, not just somebody that I think that somewhere some people run into problems with this because there are some people who will maybe only ask people when it's not obvious but I would say it's never obvious. And so we should assume that it's not obvious every time. And, and then update your EMR with that information. So ask about pronouns and names, like what do you like to be called? And do you have a pronoun that you use? Or what pronouns do you use? And somebody might say, I don't care. And then you can say, okay, well, if what would we wanna to use today? If I was gonna to refer to you with a pronoun and they might still say, I don't care. And then, um, and then I think a good default always is to use they, them, because, um, because it's never really the wrong pronoun. Um, asking about gender identity, another big way to do that. Educating yourself. This is important just because of what Leo talked about, where, where we really want to be understanding where a patient is coming from or trying to. And I think it's the trying to that makes more of an impact than actually understanding. And then being trauma informed and recognizing that a lot of these patients are already on an uphill battle and struggling with this and that it's hard for them just to come in and put themselves in a space that may not be gender inclusive or gender like gender affirming. And so, um, and so we wanna just assume everybody in all areas of care that we don't know what's going on as far as um, their background or what's informing where they are today. And then creating a gender inclusive environment. Ideally, we're just not gendering things in our offices and clinics um, and, and um, spaces are less gendered in general, and especially in the education materials and in your paperwork. And then in case it doesn't get touched on somewhere else, I also want to say that in the EMR, I read so many notes from providers who who write that the patient has a preferred name and pronoun or a chosen name and pronoun, but then use the wrong pronouns throughout their their, their visit note. And, um, and that is distressing for a couple of reasons. It's just reinforcing that they're not, um, that they're not respecting that patient's pronouns and name and identity. So they're not really seeing that patient. But also patients now can pretty much read most of the notes that we put in the EMR. So ideally from provider to provider, we're sending the message that I see this patient, I hear what they're telling me and I'm respecting that in the notes that I'm writing about them. And that's hopefully like, that's a pretty clear sign of how you're reflecting that in your care. So I think that's a big important piece that gets underemphasized. So making mistakes, um, people all make mistakes. I make them all the time. <laughs> so if I misgender somebody right away, I wanna not get defensive about it because a lot of people are maybe gonna see that as an offense or a microaggression. And I certainly don't intend for that to be the case. I make mistakes misgendering all kinds of people, my dog, everybody. So I guess my feeling or not the feeling, but everybody makes these mistakes and owning the mistake is the best way to handle that. If you catch yourself in the moment, just say, oh, sorry, I apologize. And then use the correct pronoun and move on. Um, what's not helpful that I do sometimes see people do is they'll say, oh, I'm never going to get it right. Or, oh, you know what I mean. And that's kind of dismissing or really dismissing the way that that might impact a patient. If you just own it and say, I'm sorry, I'm still learning. 
I'm going to get this. Um, then that says, I see you and I recognize that I made this mistake and I'm going to try to not do that again. So we're talking about ways that people transition. So sometimes this happens in stages. Sometimes it doesn't happen in this order for sure. And sometimes there isn't a one of these transition, like one of these aspects of transition where, and for lots of people, it's all of these things. So a social transition or affirmation socially of a gender identity usually starts often with name and pronouns, changing the name and using ones that like pronouns that feel right for them. And sometimes I'm also going to say, especially with trans youth, they might try five different names on. And technically, we all have the luxury of changing our name if we want to. And we can change it as many times as we want if you want to pay the $375 change fee. But um, but I think being patient with people and encouraging people to try different names on is important rather than, oh, what's it going to be this week? I think that that's um, uh, a an important piece of a transition is just trying things on. And that's a big part of what the social transition or affirmation is about. Um, it also has to do with appearance and how you're presenting yourself, public spaces and what restrooms you choose to use. That's not as easy as it has been in the past, but ideally that's something that's still available for people. And, um, and then the physicality, some people use packers, binders to bind their breast or packers to, um, change the appearance of what they look like in pants, or um, they tuck to change the way that they look in clothes, and then uh, things like stand to pee devices. And then people can also, um, we refer people to voice therapy and physical therapy to work on gait and um, the tone of the voice. Medical affirmation um, is uh, a different aspect of transition. So um, puberty blockers and anti-androgens are no longer available to transgender youth in Utah that don't have an existing diagnosis um, from 2000 or 22 and, and before. So fewer and fewer patients are coming in or fewer and fewer, like fewer young people are coming in with an existing diagnosis. Puberty blockers would stop somebody's puberty sort of in its tracks and allow them some time to pause and think about living in their gender identity without the stress of progressing puberty, which happens so fast that it can be pretty overwhelming um, for people. Anti-androgens would uh, suppress testosterone, um, and those are no longer legal here. What we can do that's also fully reversible is menstrual suppression. So this can happen in any primary care office, and we'll talk about that. And then partially reversible interventions would be gender affirming hormones. So some of those effects are permanent and some of them are not. Again, that's not available um, for many of the Utah minors now. And then gender affirming surgery, which really isn't available to anybody under the age of 18 here in Utah. And, um, and across the country, pretty nobody does gender affirming bottom surgery. So anything below the belt doesn't happen until somebody's 18 or older anywhere in the US. Um, but top surgery is available still and appropriate for um, younger patients, um, usually not very young, but closer to 16 is not unusual for um, uh, trans males to um, make that change for their body to feel more affirmed. Menstrual suppression, this is a big one, a meaningful intervention that we can do in primary care, um, going to Planned Parenthood, any of those things. And we certainly do it in our clinic. And for a lot of people, this might be all that they need to do um, until they're 18. And not everybody, but certainly um, when we're talking about, and I think it's important to talk in your clinic with patients about what parts of, um, being their gender identity is most distressing. So when we're asking patients, we're talking about like, how do you feel about periods? So if it's a birth assigned female who identifies as male, we're asked how do they feel about periods? And some people really don't feel bothered by their period. It's not the part that is frustrating for them. It's their breasts or it's another part of their body or their experience that is causing distress. But for lots of people, um, having a period is just a monthly reminder that they are not 
um, physically embodying the gender identity that they have. And lots of cis girls don't want to have a period either. And there's really no reason that anybody has to anymore because we use um, norethindrone at five milligrams. It's not approved for birth control, but it probably works like birth control. And, um, and they take it daily to stop a period. Um, you can also do this with oral contraceptives. Any sort of combination pill that somebody takes continuously can stop a period. And so we have more than like, we have many patients that come in that have seen primary care providers that prescribe this for them. And that's made a huge difference as far as the urgency for them to get into our clinic and how they feel affirmed by their PCP in the first place. The IEDs and um, the norm, like the exponent implants are not very effective at stopping periods. I think that those are on our list because they may be more helpful for um, adults looking to have um, to, to have some amenorrhea happen, but in teenagers, these are not, not good options for stopping periods. Great long acting birth control though, which is important. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what's changed in Utah? In 2023, on January 28th, Senate Bill, like Senate Bill 16 was signed into law um, and the law prevents any Utah um, prescriber. So anybody licensed in Utah, it prevents them from prescribing to patients in Utah any puberty blockers, anti-androgens, or gender-affirming hormones until they're 18, unless they have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria prior to the bill signing on January 28th of 2023. And a documented diagnosis can come from any healthcare provider. So it could have been a therapist, it could have been your dentist. Um, somebody has to have put it in a note that says that this patient has distress around their gender and called it gender dysphoria in a visit note. And so we need that documentation in order to be able to provide care in Utah with prescriptions. So um, we can provide care to anybody over 18 and um, we can provide care and write prescriptions for those medications or the prohibited medications for anybody who has that diagnosis. And they also have to have been established in our clinic for at least six months. So they have to have been seeing us or a provider in our clinic for at least six months before we can prescribe. And they need to see a newly, like there's a new doctoral certificate that, um, therapists can get with 40 hours of ped specific transgender education, which is a tall order given um, what's available. Um, and then they can apply for this certificate. The patient needs to have seen that provider for three visits. And then that provider can write a letter of support in addition to meeting the other criteria. That's the, the other hurdle that somebody has to, um, has to, check that box in order to get prescriptions in Utah. So it's fewer and farther between that we have patients that meet criteria for this, given that people are aging out of having had a diagnosis. Most people are not diagnosed with gender dysphoria until puberty starts. So until their body starts changing, they probably don't even know they are trans. So we have other pathways to care. Um, in our clinic, if we see a patient and they don't meet criteria for hormones in Utah, then we are working with Colorado providers um, to coordinate care. So the way that that looks in our clinic is that we'll see a patient, they're gonna see our psychologist first, um, and then they'll do a psych evaluation that kind of evaluates goals of treatment and a history. This is not the same as the therapist that they need to see, but she is a specialist who, um, helps to gather a history, look for comorbidities, um, identify complications in a diagnosis, and then um, and then we see them, the medical doctor will see them in our clinic. One of three providers can see them for a new patient visit. Um, and we will do a physical exam, do more intake questions, gather more of a history, and then um, Sometimes at that first visit, if it's if they have a longstanding diagnosis and have you know somebody who's been transitioned since kindergarten is finally getting ready to start hormones, they might come to our clinic at this point. They and 
and they might have the diagnosis, but they're right in puberty. And so we'd have to get them to Colorado because they haven't met the six month criteria. So we would send them over urgently to get started on a puberty blocker if that's appropriate. Um, for most patients, what it looks like is they see us one or two times, then we send a referral to our Colorado um, provider who sees them just to write the prescription essentially. Um, and then we see them every three months per the WPATH guidelines or World Professional Association of Transgender Health Professional guidelines. Um, we see somebody every three months after starting hormones for at least the first year, often the first two years, but, um, and then after that every six months. So as long as we're titrating or managing a dose, we're seeing somebody more frequently. And then they're seen annually in Colorado for um, just to manage that prescription. Um, and the advantage to this is a, a few different things. They can get treatment locally. We'll do all the labs and um, the care coordination from our end. Other options for patients are to just go and see an out-of-state provider that they can do independently. So they can make an appointment at Denver Health or a place in Nevada um, and or fly to Connecticut or wherever they want to get care. And they'll probably have to do that every three months with that care provider. So we're only coordinating care with patients that we're direct referring. And then other options that work for patients, um, certainly who don't live very close to our clinic, then this might be a better option. They can drive out of state over the border into Colorado or over the border into Nevada where gender affirming hormones are illegal. And there are a number of different online providers that will manage their prescriptions, including puberty blockers entirely virtually every three months by just driving out of state and, and doing a telehealth visit. Next slide, Ariel. Thanks. Okay, takeaways. So um, LGBTQ youth and transgender youth make up about 1.4% of the population. So you know you're gonna see these people in your life and in your clinic. Um, rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide are higher in this population. So we really wanna make sure that we're creating gender affirming spaces so that we can positively impact um, the lives of these patients. And um, medications are appropriate. I'm gonna get on a tangent here for a second because you can read the rest of that slide. But I wanna say that Leo and Tanya their story is amazing, but they also had a gender affirming primary care provider. So they walked into that office and had a longstanding relationship with a primary care provider who recognized in Leo um, that he was struggling with this. And then they broached that, that PCP talked about that with Tanya. And she got him a therapist that was going to be able to address this. And that family has the resources to send Leo to camp or get him top surgery so that he can continue to swim. I would say that the majority of our patients and the people that you're seeing in your clinic don't have that sort of res those resources. And the big one that they had, aside from like the ability to do all that, is that Leo had gender affirming pa like parents who were willing to change course of what they had expected maybe when they had Leo, right? And um, but every step along the way and especially starting with that PCP made a tremendous difference in the trajectory of their care, but also in the mental health experience that Leo has. And so um, I hear so many patients, like we have so many patients that want us to be their primary care provider because they just don't even feel comfortable talking about this with their PCP. So, and we're not a primary care provider. So I'm constantly looking for people to put on a list to refer people to. And I hear very few positive experiences that people are having with primary care providers. And so um, ideally in primary care, that's where a lot of these questions are getting asked. And a lot of, um, a lot of these patients are never going to ever make it to our clinic. And so managing this in a primary care setting is so important for the overall mental health of these kids that we all love and care about. And um, and so I think we can all make the difference in that in every level, like just in the way that like we're moving through the world to help everybody feel more comfortable in the world. That's my spiel. <laughs> and, and you don't need a referral to come be seen at our clinic. Anybody can schedule for gender affirming care 
in, um, in the adolescent medicine clinic. So they can just call the schedule. Tanya and Leo talked about it being a six month wait or a five month wait. And that used to be the case. We're seeing less and less of, uh, less and less patients are coming to us because I think that they feel like there aren't options now in Utah. Um, I would encourage you to send patients to us if, if patients are looking for gender affirming care, even if it's just to come and have an experience where somebody's talking and focused on their gender and, um, and how that impacts them. And um, there are ways to help uh, patients get to Colorado for care. And for lots of patients, they're never going to leave the state. They're not going to get care that way. But just coming to a place where that's the focus and and they feel heard and listened to, it's like we're like the only pediatric specialty where we have patients that like look forward to their visits. So that's a big deal, I think. Um, and so now the wait is like two or three months to get into our clinic. So send them our way. That's what I wanna say. Now I'm done. And these are all some resources. Um, there are actually more resources than what I see on here, but certainly in Circle, like Leo talked about, it's a great place for parents and kids to start. They, um, uh, I will say like the Pride Center sometimes can feel sort of intimidating, I think, for people that are parents that maybe are struggling. And in Circle is almost uh, designed to help that transition for parents. So I would say their parent groups are really helpful. I hear that all the time from parents that going to the encircle parent groups, um, then they're not going to be overwhelmed with everybody pro transition. It's parents just like them that are struggling to accept this sometimes. Um, I think it was started by a, a Mormon family that, um, or an LDS family that, uh, that was struggling with this in their own community and then created a safe haven and has now created a space that uh, feels welcoming to everybody. And I think that that's a great place to start. So I would refer people there for sure. And then there are other access uh, or grants and things available. Elevated access, I don't have on this list, but like they are willing to fly people for gender affirming care all over the country um, for free and their families. And there are a group of volunteer pilots that literally just answered like a bat call when you send out a request, like this person needs to get to Colorado. They can go to a local airport down the street from their house and fly to Colorado with a local pilot or a pilot that says, yeah, I'll go do that for free. So it's very like, there are people out there who want to help, but connecting with resources can be tricky. And so, um, and so we always want to help people navigate that. Okay. And maybe I mean, I'll take this one if that's okay. Yeah, please. Yes. So we, um, we as a program have a lot of educational resources that come out of our program, but just other resources that we're just very aware of. So one of the big things that we're trying to make uh, a lot of local Utah healthcare providers aware of is the Mountain West Transforming Care Conference. And this is an annual conference that we've been hosting for about the last five or six years. Um, the next offering of this will be in May of 2025, and uh, it's going to be in Springdale, so near Zion National Park. It'll be offered hybrid, um, so you will have options for virtual attendance as well as in person. Um, but really, a lot of the topics are going to focus on LGBTQ health, um, and it's a great way for providers who are either just starting out on this journey and starting to see LGBTQ patients um, expand their knowledge or just kind of network with other providers to kind of get that peer support um, and, and consultation with each other. Um, so that is available. We also have scholarships for virtual attendance. If you've run out of professional development funds and, and would still like to attend, we'd love to see you there. And then um, there's also a bunch of other free CME, CEU opportunities through the LGBTQIA Health Education Center um, for not only uh, primary care providers, but also mental health providers. Um, so that's a really great resource as well. Um, and I think these other ones are, they're just linked here, but um, our, our website has more information on that, but I mostly wanted to touch on the conference. And then this is information. Haley, do you want to speak to just kind of how those referrals maybe come in and end up to your clinic? Yeah, I should have looked at this slide. So the number to call to 
see us is um, 801-213-3599. Sorry, and you can go to that transgender health website and navigate to the adolescent, um, like to care for minors or on the adolescent health. Um, but you can send a referral if you want, or you can just tell uh, patients to call. I would say sending the referral almost delays the process because um, it takes a while for that to get through referrals. And then, and then our scheduling team is only going to call a patient like one time. Um, and then try again, maybe days later, and people don't check their messages. So I would encourage people to call um, to schedule. And you want to do that not through the transgender health. So I know that they get referrals at transgender health like that at the University of Utah transgender health program site. But ultimately, we're in the primary children's building and we're part of the Department of Pediatrics. So um, they want to so call and schedule a visit with adolescent medicine. So this phone number, Haley, is actually a phone tree. So our first option, I believe, will actually, if somebody presses like okay. option one, it'll send them to adolescent medicine. And then there's okay. other phone tree options that will get them to different services. So never they can get to y'all from there. I've never called the phone tree, but that'll get you there, it sounds like. So yeah. Um, so um yeah, but they can just call the schedule. And I would encourage people to call the schedule, even if they are just exploring like. I think my kid might be struggling with this or they came out and the, you know, and we're just looking for more information. And um, because I, and I also want to mention that I think a lot of people um, are concerned about scheduling in our clinic because they're worried that this puts them on a trajectory or sets them on a, on a path to transitioning. So families, I notice when I'm talking to them, were reluctant for years to schedule because they wanted to make sure they were ready. And, um, and, and, this is part of that process. So we're not sure somebody's ready just because they're sure, you know? So, um, and a lot of this is information gathering. So it's not unusual to see patients that we have come into clinic and that we see for a year that say, this isn't for me right now or ever or or any of those things. And, and our goal is just to help um, support a patient, however they're identifying and and in whatever their journey needs to look like for them at the time. So um, it's not too early to come early, that's all. Oh, but it is too early if you wanna come before like age eight or seven, cause then we don't wanna see you. <laughs> then you should be seeing a mental health provider, but we pretty much will only see kids about seven and older and only the seven year olds if we're concerned or if a parent is concerned that they are approaching puberty or are, are wanting to figure out how to navigate that care when the time comes. But a five-year-old, we're not really ready to see, to help navigate that journey yet. That should be done at home with social affirmation and with a therapist if needed. A lot of kids don't need therapy because they're like, this is who I am. I don't need somebody to work this out with me, you know? So, but we do require a therapist for anybody that we're gonna start any kind of medical transition with or even advocate for that way. So, okay, now I'm really done. Any questions? Thank you so much, Haley and Ariel. Yeah, we'll open it up for questions. We have a couple minutes. Anybody has any questions? That was a lot of really great information and good to know that, um, I love how you explained that what options are still available regardless of current legislation and um, also that um, it's a good place for people to start regardless of kind of where they're at in their journey, so. You know, this is Eric Christensen with Department of Health and Human Services. Um, prior to the legislation, um, how good were insurances with covering um, gender affirming care? It depends on the insurance. So prior to the legislation, even Medicaid was covering most of the gender affirming care options for transgender youth, provided they um, met criteria, right? For so puberty blockers are really the most expensive medications involved in uh, gender affirming care. So, just to say, around like thirteen hundred dollars for a six month injection of a puberty blocker. It's fully reversible, but now um, post legislation. Even PHP is not covering, even if they, even if a patient meets criteria. So even if it's legal for them to have it, they have an existing diagnosis, they're now in puberty, then 
those insurances are not Medicaid and PEHP are no longer covering, but still actually Select Health doesn't even require a prior authorization for any of this. So I would say that across the board, a lot of the um, national companies and a lot of the local ones are still covering um, gender affirming care pretty well. And certainly um, visits in Utah are covered, which is why it makes sense for a lot of people to access care through us and then only have to go once a year to Denver. So if somebody has Medicaid, then their visits are still covered in Utah, but they're not necessarily covered in Colorado. So yeah, thanks. Any other questions? I'm gonna ask another one. Um, I, you know, looking at, you know, how controversial, um, you know, just it is in the, in the public sphere about, um, you know, transgender and especially gender affirming care with, with youth, um, you know, having kids go out of state, how has that been received? Um, I can only imagine, but I just, didn't know what like local uh, or, you know, Utah perception has been of that. Well, I have to say that part of why we're not getting very many patients in clinic, I think, is because we're not advertising that there is a pathway. Right. So um, I think for a good reason, we're not just sort of saying, yeah, you can still get care. We're just going to send you over the border. Right. Because then we're worried that that's going to um, limit what we can do that way. Um and uh, and so um, so unfortunately, it means that only people with resources and means can access that care. Um, I don't. I'm hoping that the legislation doesn't change to make that more difficult. Um, I would also just mention here that like different care providers have different ideas and different thresholds for who qualifies for gender affirming care. So we've had to be sort of selective about who we're going to work with in Colorado, just because we want to make sure that they align with where we are a lot. We are more conservative in our clinic than I would say there that I'm seeing in lots of clinics across the country. So, um, so we usually start hormones a little bit later and have more of a process of wanting to have a relationship with the patient and their history than um, some clinics in Colorado or other places. And I think that that's by design in both places, right? Like we want to lower access barriers in Colorado. And then here we want to be more conservative, mostly because it's just a better, in our mind, a better standard of care because it is a, a controversial area. But, um, and I think parents appreciate and families appreciate for the most part, how conservative we are just because this is a really hard decision for parents to make. So did that answer your question? It did. No, thank you. It just, uh, I, I was very curious about that and, um, you know, how that's perceived. I, uh, and going back to the thoughts of do families, you know, know where to go or do a lot of times families just kind of give up on that because they know, you know, Utah has these, you know, very strict, laws about that type of care. I mean, I think a lot of families, them? yeah, feel like all of a sudden when the legislation passed that it's not an option in Utah and they better figure out how they're going to budget to get their kids out of state, not realizing that we can do anything in part because we can't advertise that we're doing that. You know, I mean, it's not on a website or something where it says, you know, we're going to get you care no matter what, you know, <laughs> so yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. And the, all the more reason that we're so glad you could come <clears throat> share with us today because a lot of people on this call do work in clinics where they can, you know, use that information, hopefully to help guide some families toward your care and your clinic in the future, since we know it is a resource. Um, were there any final questions? <clears throat> I'm going to launch the um, evaluation. Can I say one more thing yes, that I'm thinking of? So I think that um, I want to reemphasize that sending somebody to our clinic, I think a lot of parents are also afraid to come and maybe even care providers are afraid to refer because um, they are concerned that 
this sets them on the path, like we're going to find them care, or they're worried about coming in and their kids hearing that there's access available, but that their, their parents just aren't going to do it right. And so I think families don't want to be put in a situation where it looks like the parents are the barrier. And I'll just emphasize here that we really work so hard not to ever put a parent in a position where they're the roadblock. So we always want to be the roadblock and we always want to um, assess like whether or not this is an option and emphasize that it's not an option for a lot of people. So we wouldn't expect everybody to just be able to, like if you love your kid enough, you're going to get them to Colorado. Like that's never ever, um, like we want to work against that idea so that ultimately we want everybody in our clinic and all of our patients to be supported by both of their parents or anybody in their life that they interact with and feel supportive of that decision. And we want to make sure that nobody's in a position where they feel like they're not accessing care because the parents can't afford it or their um, parents are reluctant. So we try to make sure that they feel like we're the roadblock or the impediment, not their family. Ideally, the family gets to be 100% supportive because there are so many blocks in the way that even if a parent wasn't supportive, them telling their kids that they support them and showing up at a visit shows support. And so I always encourage parents to like call me in front of their kids so that they can hear them advocating for them. Can I get a sooner visit? Can I get these things? I'm going to call the nurse and see if she can do something because they should be seen as the ones that are supporting their kids. And then if there are blocks in the way, even if like, if we hear that a parent is like not supportive or reluctant to start anything, we want it to be like, well, we're not ready yet. Like instead of mom's not ready. So if that makes sense, I just feel like that's a thing that so many parents worry about is that coming to see us means that they're giving their kids the okay and then anything can happen. And really there's so many things that have to happen before somebody even like starts any kind of transition. Some people see us for like three years before anything like that happens. So, sorry to interrupt, but go ahead. <laughs> That's great. I think that was a great um, note to end on and really important for um, everyone to know. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm okay if, um, yeah, we have just like two more minutes for questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch our, we just do a little evaluation at the end of each of our meetings. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch that now. But if people have additional questions, go ahead, feel free to unmute yourself or uh, type in the chat. Um, and we can have those few final questions while everyone's taking their evaluation. Um, and I'll do a reminder that our next meeting is happening November 20th. Uh, and the topic for that meeting is going to be around trauma screening. So we have um, so a speaker coming from Safe and Healthy Families to come and talk to us for that meeting. And then as always, feel free to keep communicating in between meetings um, using the listserv and or our uh, Facebook page. And yes, thank you for sending the slides. That would be great with our meeting notes. Thanks so much for having us, you all. Yes, thank you. This is a really, really informative meeting. So we're glad that you could join us. Thank you. I'm going to jump off for another meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Haley. That's it for us today. Everyone will see you in November. Um, and feel free to just log off as soon as you finish your evaluation. And Athena, hope you and your family are doing well in North Carolina. We are. We're. 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 Our, our house and family are doing great. The water, power, all that stuff. The lot, the larger area is not doing so well, but our family is doing just fine. Our son um, won't probably go back to school though, still for a couple of weeks because his school district. Okay. Impacted, but other than that, we're we're doing okay. Okay. Well, all the best to you guys. Thank you. You bet.